Now, the reaction of alkali metals with water has always been a staple of high school chemistry because it's so simple. It's just the alkali metal plus water gives alkali hydroxide plus hydrogen. It's as simple as chemistry gets. But is it really? So previously, we, after some rather exciting preliminary experiments, managed to get the alkali metal, mostly sodium potassium alloy, simply because it was relatively easy to handle, to explode basically on command within a millisecond or so and within a millimeter or so of an aim point. This led to the discovery of a new mechanism for the explosion of the alkali metals in water. Well, that was last year's science. I'm sure it was kind of cute, but the non-explosive reaction of the alkali metals when they're just generally put onto water, that's got to be pretty straightforward, right? Well, I don't know. Let's take a look up close and personal and under an argon atmosphere filmed at 1,000 frames per second. So the alkali metal is added to the water, at which point it goes blue, and then it goes on. Well, what? It goes blue? Yep. It goes as blue as it comes, and it does it again and again and again and again. There's just this blue skin that appears on the metal. But after that, it's just the alkali metal plus water gives alkali hydroxide plus hydrogen, right? Uh, no. Then the blue skin vanishes, and you get this blue gas atmosphere that then turns into a red flame with an odd but rather characteristic color. So, firstly it loses its metallic nature. As you can see, it's metallic from the reflection of the diva light in the ball. It goes from this shiny metal ball to a black, non-shiny ball, and it gets incandescently hot. Then it goes blue and leaves a colorless liquid, which then, <laughs> why not? It explodes in less than a millisecond, which makes perfect sense because it's just alkali metal plus water gives alkali hydroxide plus hydrogen. So how do we transform a ball of metal, which is immiscible with water and immiscible with alkali hydroxide and turn it into a clear, transparent droplet. Well, it turns out that blue color skin, you can actually recreate that independently by just putting a drop of water onto sodium potassium alloy. And it's a very, okay, look at this. It's blue? Blue, yes. Is it good blue? Yeah, good blue. Now it's then blue. Spectacular <coughs> blue. Yeah. Blue ring. Uh, I keep the... Camel couple has an arrow. <laughs> That's useful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, lots of blue there. And it's completely blacked out on yeah. the screen. It's quite persistent and lasts for a few seconds. Indeed, it's quite easy to measure the spectrum of, and you don't even need an argon atmosphere for it. That's fantastically blue, though. The spectrum bears a convincing resemblance to the spectrum of the solvated electron in water. And while the lifetime of the solvated electron in water is rather limited, microseconds type thing, this really isn't water. It's more molten alkali hydroxide at about 300 degrees Celsius. Not only that, but it's also in contact with the alkali metal, which can act as a reservoir for an ongoing source of electrons. Interestingly, you get a very similar color if you just electrolyze molten cesium chloride. There we go, that's it. How's that then? It's crystallized blue. The color of the gas that you see is somewhat easier to characterize. Sodium and potassium gases are various colors from green to purple, somewhat depending on the pressure and temperature. So if you just get the alkali metal in an alumina tube and just heat it, First of all, you see the absorption line for the atomic gas, and then as the vapor pressure increases, you see the pressure broadening on this line. Eh, kind of similar to what you see in the low and high pressure sodium streetlights, only here the process is obviously reversed. You know, you're looking at absorption, not emission. 
Then the vaporized metal gas eventually starts to burn in the water vapor, which once the vapor pressure is high enough, gives you this flame with this very characteristic color, which contains strong absorption lines for the alkali metals. Now, once the temperature gets over about 300 degrees Celsius, any hydroxide there will actually start to react with the metal to give the oxide. And at these elevated temperatures, that becomes soluble in the metal. Essentially, what you're looking at is the reverse of the alkali metals dissolving in liquid ammonia. That is, at very high concentrations of alkali metals in ammonia, for the solution, it appears metallic in nature. However, as the concentration of that drops, you start to lose the conduction band. It goes from essentially what looks like a metal to something that is very deeply colored which is why as our concentration of metal drops, we first of all start to lose that metallic sheen, and then it goes black. And at the very end of the reaction, the concentration of the electrons drops, so you can actually see the blue color again. Now, at this point, it becomes fairly obvious that the reaction between the alkali metal and the water is mostly a gaseous reaction of the steam with either the liquid or gaseous metal a point that can be graphically made simply by putting a drop of the alloy suspended on a platinum wire into a steam and argon atmosphere. Here we go. There he is. Nice shiny. And there's nothing left. Clearly in the gas phase reaction, there is enough energy to entirely vaporize this reaction. Indeed, you can see just from this smoke given off by a typical reaction that a significant amount of the product ends up in the vapor. And indeed, in rare cases, you can actually isolate that drop at the end with various degrees of success and titrate it by its mass to work out the composition of it in terms of sodium hydroxide and sodium oxide. And it's it's comparable quantities of both, so about 50% of the oxide, 50% of the hydroxide. However, once the reaction stops, it would seem that the only thing keeping that drop aloft is the Leiden frost effect. Similar to the drops of water skidding around on a hot stove, although well, this is actually a fairly impressive one, given that the density of both sodium hydroxide and sodium oxide are about twice that of water. And then as this cools, comes a point where the vapor layer collapses, leading to a sub-millisecond bursting of the droplet. So in summary, what appeared to be on the surface, really quite simple high school chemistry, was anything but. And under the surface, which was in turn shiny and blue and black and even transparent, it was actually a symphony of fascinating high-energy chemistry.